feast for choir. service, if you will stand, please take your hymn book and let's sing number 33, Christ the Road.
Matthew 20. Matthew 26, 36 reads, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Set ye here, while I go and pray yonder. Verse 39 reads, And he went a little farther, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus suffered for our sins. Luke 23, 33 through 34. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the malefactors, one on the right hand, the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Jesus paid the debt of my sin fully. He was our substitute. He was the lamb in our place.
John 17, 4 and 5 reads, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. John 19, verse 30 reads, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. It was finished. The body of Jesus was lowered from the cross and placed in the tomb. Finished yet, not the end. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon him. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay.
Revelations 5-2 reads, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Verse 9 reads, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by the blood. Verses 11 and 12. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. Worthy the Lamb. <laughs> Amen. You may be seated this morning. Amen. Well, we want to welcome everyone here this morning. 
to our Easter Sunday services, and it's just an honor and a privilege to be able to see our church full this morning and see everyone here, and we just want to thank you for being here. We just want to make a few announcements this morning about some things going on in the life and ministry of our church. I want to remind you that next Sunday, Dr. James Ray is going to be here from BIMI. He'll be with us during the Sunday school hour and the morning service, and uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a great blessing here, being able to hear him preach uh, next Sunday morning. He's one of our missionaries that we support, and so we hope you'll come. Be praying for him as he travels and be here uh, next week for that. Also, our um, spring ladies meeting is going to be on April the 21st at noon, and they're going to have a tea and do some different fun things. So uh, any of our ladies that are here today, we want to invite you to come out and be a part of that. And uh, you can just ask any of our ladies that are normally here, and they can help you uh, know a little bit more about that and how much uh, they're going to do and the fun things they're going to do on April the 21st. And then also, um, our Awana ended last Wednesday, and through the summer we do a different program called Patch the Pirate. And we're going to have a meeting this Wednesday at 6.30 for anybody who would like to help us with Patch the Pirate. And uh, that will be just our final preparations for that. And then the following Wednesday we'll begin uh, having Patch the Pirate. It will begin at 7 o'clock instead of 6.30, which is what we normally do with Awana. And so that will push us back a little bit. But anybody who would like to help with that, just come to our meeting on Wednesday at 6.30. And we'll let you know how you can be a help to us there as well. Uh, this morning, we just want to ask our men to come forward now. We'll take up our tithes, our offering, and our faith promise this morning. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this special day that it is, Heavenly Father. Uh, Lord, we come back. We thank you, God, for sending my way for us to stand ahead. Uh, stay in touch with Tina, baby. Come get some of you. Yes. Amen. Appreciate that. Then the choir do a good job this morning with their music, uh, Easter music, musical this morning. They're going to present that again tonight, and so if you'd like to hear that again, and also it might be a good opportunity just to invite somebody who didn't wasn't able to make it here this morning, uh, invite them to come tonight and hear that wonderful message of our Savior, how He died on the cross for our sins, uh, but He didn't stay in that grave. He rose again on the third day, and that's why we celebrate uh, Easter today. And so I hope. Uh, the music this morning has blessed you and gotten your heart ready for the preaching of God's Word. And so we're going to ask our pastor to come down and preach for us. Amen. Thank you, Evan. I want to say good morning on behalf of our church to everyone today. Thank you for coming. It's been a great day already. And it's a joy to see everyone in the services. And I'm thankful for folks that are visiting and for family and Folks that are here, thank you so much for coming. I just want you to know what an exciting thing and what a privilege it is for us to have you with us today. And uh, we hope that if you uh, are looking for or don't have a home church, you'll just uh, pray and let the Lord lead and guide you. And if we can be of any help to answer any questions or anything for you about our church, we'd love to do that. But it's just uh, just a good, good day, and uh, it's just an exciting place to be. I, I do want to say as well what a great job the choir did. That was tremendous. And uh, those songs were great. I sat and listened, and I thought, you know, sometimes you go to places, 
and uh, you know maybe a museum or somewhere where you're learning about things and you'll sit in a little video and you'll watch a video that maybe show, shows you about an important piece of history or about an individual and they'll visualize that and you can learn about that. You know, I just thought this morning as I listened to those songs, that gave such a great picture of the ministry of the Lord and what he did for us that we could just see it as we listened. And uh, so I'm thankful for that. The choir did a great job. I know you put in a lot of work on that. And uh, did a tremendous job presenting Worthy the Lamb. And I'm looking forward to hearing it again tonight. And as Evan mentioned, be sure to try to bring someone with you this evening. And uh, come back again this evening and listen again. And I know it will be a blessing to you. All of our choir did a great job. And those ladies, those young ladies look beautiful. Amen. This did a wonderful job stepping up there and singing for us. And uh, what a thrilling thing. And uh, we're excited about that. And uh, thank God for His goodness to us. Well, today is Easter Sunday. And, uh, you know, uh, over 2,000 years ago on that first Easter morning, uh, that big stone that had been rolled in front of the tomb to seal it closed was rolled away. And when that seal was rolled away and we looked inside through the Scripture and see an empty tomb, you know what that does? That sealed my salvation. And it just seals the fact that in the Lord we can have joy and peace uh, that no man can touch or take away. And so this is such a great day. And uh, we're thankful for Easter Sunday and all that it means for us. And we're thankful for all of you that are here with us this morning as well. We want to take uh, the time that we have remaining this morning and we want to open up our Bibles today on one of the greatest days in the calendar year. And uh, we want to look into God's Word and we want to examine a little further uh, Easter, what it means, what it's all about. And I want to ask you, if you will, to take the Bible that you have. And if you need a Bible, there's one right in a pew near you. And open it up to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. And this morning, I want us to consider this, life's greatest invitation. Life's greatest invitation. There may be some invitations in your life that you've been given that were thrilling for you, maybe somewhere you were able to go, uh, something you were able to attend, uh, someone you might have been able to go and meet, maybe, that you really admired or had always thought about being able to meet, many invitations that we get and that we receive in life. But I want you to consider the greatest invitation of life from Matthew chapter 28 and uh, verse number 1. Uh, we're going to begin there in verse 1. And uh, let's look into the Word of God. Matthew 28, verse 1. The Bible says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. The angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. And we'll stop right there, but I'll draw your attention back to the sixth verse and the last part of that verse. Here we have, I think, life's greatest invitation. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. I want us to look there today through the eye of Scripture, at that place where the Lord was laid almost 2,000 years ago today. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for how good you are to us. And God, our heart has been thrilled today to hear these wonderful songs. And Lord, what a joy it is to know today that as we stand here, and Lord, we, we have, Lord, interaction with and contact with all the people that are in this service today. Lord, just as real as that is, Lord, we know today that you're a living Savior seated at the right hand of God. 
And that, Lord, you are today salvation, full and free, for every man, woman, boy, and girl who will receive you as their personal Savior. Thank you, Father, for the reality of these truths. Lord, thank you that through the many years, God, they've been preached and taught. They have been accepted and believed and stood upon. And Lord, we know today there are many saints in glory in heaven who could testify of the reality of these truths and what they mean to them now. Lord, we just pray this morning as we are here in this service now, what good preaching, uh, Lord, we need. God, we need to hear from you. Lord, we need the Holy Spirit today just to take your word and just to make it alive and quicken it to our hearts and lives. Lord, thank you for all the things in the service that have been done to help us worship you. And Lord, now again, we're thankful for everyone you've assembled together. Lord, meet each of us at the place of need that we are at in our own lives. Help us, God, to respond by faith to you. Uh, Lord, we just ask now that you'll do today what would glorify you on this Easter day. And we'll give you thanks for it. We ask it all in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we were reading a few weeks ago some things that uh, had to do with the great message of Easter and the resurrection of the Lord, I was confronted with a decision the writer asked me to make as I read. And he asked a question in the article that I was reading. And the question was, what personally means the most to you? And he said, does Bethlehem and the birth of Christ that we celebrate at Christmas mean more to you? Or does Easter and the empty tomb of the Lord Jesus, does that mean more to you? And you know, that's a, that's a challenging question, isn't it? You know, when we think about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and the things that we know are recorded about his life, they are all the most important things to us in this world. Everything about the Lord is important. When you think about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, he had a miraculous divine birth. The Bible teaches us uh, that he had a, his birth was a virgin birth. That means that man had nothing to do with the conception of Christ or the birth of Christ. That the uh, holy blood of God that was untainted by the sin of humanity is the blood that flowed in the veins of Jesus Christ. He was pure. The Bible tells us he lived a sinless life. That's important for us because we cannot do that. We know that we've all been born sinners. We know that we have been born uh, and conceived in sin, but we all know we choose to sin. We were discussing in our Sunday school class, you know, as a parent, we know we have to teach children to do the right thing. We don't have to teach them how to do the wrong thing. They do that on their own. It's their nature. And so we have that sin nature of transgression and rebellion. That's what we are. And we know that Jesus Christ, though, came into this world, God in the flesh. And he lived a perfect life. He kept all the law of God to the uttermost. He, uh, he kept the pure righteousness and motives of God within his heart and life. He did everything that pleased God. Even those who had control of him uh, in the trials that the Lord stood, uh, one stood and said, I find no fault in this man at all. And we know that it's important that the Lord lived a sinless life and He endured great agonies and sufferings, undeservedly so. He did them on our behalf. And when we think about the Lord Jesus being crucified, we know that on that cross, He wasn't murdered and no one took His life. He offered up His life. He gave it as a willing sacrifice. No one, can ever, no one has ever been able to do that. We don't have the control and the power over our life as He did. And He yielded it up and He offered it as a sacrifice. And then uh, the think about the body of the Lord being tenderly taken down from that cross. And we know there were hands who cared for it and prepared it and laid it in that tomb. It was a borrowed tomb, the Bible teaches us. Those are important things. All of these things, as we think about them, as we consider them, they're the most important things our mind will ever ponder. They're the most important things we'll ever take time about to think and consider. But for me, as I was confronted with that question when, when I read that in that article, I think for me, the greatest of all these things is the invitation that we find here in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 6 to look inside the tomb to see the place where they laid the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, to know, as we find from the Scripture, that that tomb was an empty tomb. 
Now, for me, I think that's the most important thing. You know, what we commemorate here today at Easter means everything for time and eternity to men. And this morning, I just want you to think about this great invitation that's been given to us to look inside that empty tomb. The first thing I want you to consider is this invitation was given. Verse number 6, we find an invitation from God by an angelic messenger. And you know this invitation to come and see the place where the Lord lay. We know today that God intended that invitation to be for all men everywhere. I thought about it yesterday as we were praying about today. And and you know, this morning we live here in, in our hemisphere of the world, in our portion of the world. And I thought about though the world in in general. And uh, I thought today, uh, early, early in the hours of darkness in, in, our, in our time zone here, already before us, Easter morning had dawned. Over in Asia and in Africa, dawn had come early and it had worked its way around the globe before it finally got to us. I thought about in Asia, we have missionaries there our church supports. Brother John Humphreys is over in Korea. You know, before we even got up this morning, I have no doubt that Brother Humphreys preached the resurrection of Jesus Christ to men and women, boys and girls, over on the continent of Asia. I thought about, uh, as we might uh, move around the world in Africa, Brother Greg Wagoner over there in Tanzania, no doubt this morning with passion and zeal, preached about a living and resurrected Savior to the people in Moshi in Tanzania. I thought about uh, in Europe, we have a missionary over in Ireland, uh, Brother Thatcher over there. I'm sure this morning he took the advantage on Easter morning to preach about a living Jesus, resurrected from the grave to those people over in Ireland. And you know today, here in South America, already uh, about the same time now as our Sunday school hour took place, I'm sure my brother-in-law, missionary in Peru, Brother Matt Harrell, got to tell some people about Jesus Christ, that He's a living Savior. All around the world today, the great message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the invitation to look inside a tomb where once He laid for only a a few short days, but now it's an empty tomb. I'm sure today that that's the great message that God would have all men to hear on Easter Sunday. And men of God are inviting others to come and look into the tomb, the place where the Lord Jesus Christ lay. And the angel said, He is not here, He is risen. He's a living and triumphant Savior. You know, men travel thousands of miles to see things. Uh, Things in nature. People travel across the country to go see uh, the Grand Canyon or to see uh, the Rocky Mountains or uh, to take in some great sight in nature that God has has shaped and formed for man to enjoy. Uh, People today will travel uh, many miles. They'll make vacations out of taking in some historical site where a battle took place or some great significant thing in history uh, occurred. There's people who will travel to graveyards where famous people have been buried and their bodies were laying beneath the ground and those bodies are still there and they'll go and they'll see those graves. You know, the greatest thing though that uh, any eye has ever seen is the empty tomb where the Lord Jesus Christ was laid. An empty tomb. And when we look into that empty tomb, though you don't see a body in that tomb, there are a couple things we do see. First thing we see is the power of God. You look into that empty tomb on that first Easter morning, you saw the power of God that had taken place. You know, earlier, angry voices had, uh, had been filled with hatred and they'd cried out that the Son of God be crucified. And then we know that uh, the rough hands of men who cared little about whether just another common criminal was going to be put to death or not took the Lord Jesus and they nailed Him to that cross. We know that uh, later as he hung on the cross, a spear that had been forged by the hands of men to kill and to make war with was thrust into the side of Christ as he hung on the cross. After he had given up his life on the cross, uh, hands of compassion and kindness that loved him uh, took the Lord Jesus down from the cross, that body, and they prepared it for burial. And they, they laid it on the shelf carved from the stone of a new tomb 
that had been given by Joseph of Arimathea to place the body of the Lord. All of those things have been done by men's hands. Hardened soldiers who had known battle and perhaps killed men in conflict had been set to guard the tomb where the body of the Lord was laid. But you know, none of those things could hinder or stop the power of God raising His Son from the grave on that first Easter Sunday. That first day uh, there, uh, the Lord rose again from the grave and the stone was rolled away to reveal that Christ had risen. That He was alive. That He was triumphant and more powerful than death. He was victorious over the grave. And we know today that those things are His to command and that they must obey His voice. You know, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, one thing we know is true, that the Bible teaches us that it's been appointed unto all men to die. The Bible said it's appointed unto men once to die. The Bible says that death comes to all men because all have sinned and the wages of sin is death. You know, each and every one of us face an appointment with death. Sin will have its course in our life and these bodies are going to are going to are going to die, and we know that no man has power to resist that day of death. In Ecclesiastes the eighth chapter and the eighth verse, the Bible said, "There's no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit; neither hath he power in the day of death. And there is no discharge in that war. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. Death is going to come to all of us." Death means separation. Death means to be separated from this world. And if we've lived in this world separated from God, death will mean separation from God for eternity. We know that the soul of a lost man who leaves this world without Christ is going to enter a place the Bible speaks of as hell and a way to judgment day. But that body is going to be returned back to the dust of the earth and buried. You know, it's the Lord Jesus alone who has power over the day of death to defeat death. There is one who has power over that day. There is one to whom death must obey Him. There is one who has the ability and the power to give victory over the grave. And we see that power in the power of God in Jesus Christ in that empty tomb. When we see inside that empty tomb, we also see the promises of the Word of God. You know, before the Lord Jesus Christ had been crucified... He spoke of his, to His disciples of what He'd come into this world to do. In Mark chapter 8, verse 27, the Bible said Jesus went out and His disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, He asked His disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others one of the prophets. And He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. That's what Jesus Christ had said that was going to take place. These are the things that he promised his disciples that must happen. You know, after the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, He joined Himself to His disciples. And He reminded them uh, that the things that had occurred were the things that had been written of Him. These were the things that He had told them would happen to Him. Luke chapter 24 and verse number 46, after He rose from the grave, he, He said to His disciples, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. You know, despite all of Satan's efforts to stop the promises of God from being fulfilled, uh, overcoming all of the strength of man to keep the Lord Jesus Christ from resurrecting from the dead, Christ did arise, just as He said that He would. All the promises that He made about His death, burial, and resurrection were fulfilled exactly as He said they would be. And when we look in that empty tomb today, we see the power of God who has power over death, power over the grave, and the promises of God that have power to be fulfilled just exactly as He promised they would be. When I think about that empty tomb and the 
promises that Christ made that He would die, but He would rise again, I can't help but be encouraged because I find a promise there for me and for all of you that know Christ as your Savior. If you're here today and you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you look in that empty tomb and see that He had risen from the grave like He said that He would, you ought to be encouraged to know that the promises He's made concerning you will also come to pass. You remember what He said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He said in the 13th verse, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, or those that had died in the Lord that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Just as sure as the promises of God that He would die for the sins of man, that He would be buried, and that He would rise again from the grave with power over death in the grave, just as sure are the promises of God that if you'll believe in Him and trust Him as your personal Savior, He will give you victory over death, over the grave. And give you eternal life with Him forever in heaven. We look in an empty tomb. We don't see the body of the Lord. But we see the power of God. And we see the promises of God. And today, He's given us that invitation to look. But you know, I also see in that empty tomb a promise for the unsaved. You know, there's people today, maybe even in this service, you've never received Jesus as your Savior You don't have the hope and the promise that someday when it's time to die, that you're going to leave this world and be in the presence of the Lord in heaven. But there's a promise in that empty tomb for you as well. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Even for you today who are unsaved. Maybe you've never received Christ as your Savior. You look in that empty tomb. The saved have the promise they'll be given victory over the grave and given eternal life. But there's a promise for you as well because though you may die and that body that you live in today is buried, someday you're going to stand before God at the great white throne judgment. There, there, uh, we'll give an account for our life in this world without the Lord Jesus Christ. An invitation has been given, and we see it through the empty tomb. I want you to think of this. Our attention is needed. When you see into that empty tomb, we look into it through the eyes of Scripture. You're not looking into any ordinary grave. And though the Lord Jesus Christ had no royal robes in this life, and though uh, He had no earthly palace that He lived in, And though he had nothing of this world that he called his own by way of possessions, and though the crown that he wore in death was a crown of thorns, when you look into that empty tomb, you looked into the tomb of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Today, it deserves a frequent attention. It deserves our frequent attention through the course of time we each lay down beneath the sod of this earth the body of Dear friends and family members, one by one, as time goes on, we make our way to that graveside. Mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters. You know, we often return to give their graves attention, to place flowers on them and just to remember. And though the grave of Jesus was, uh, though the grave Jesus was laid in was only used for him by three days, We ought to go back to that empty tomb through Scripture time and time again and give frequent attention to that empty tomb because it reminds us that He is risen. It reminds us that He's alive. 
It reminds us of what He did for those mothers and fathers that we laid their bodies down in the grave. Uh, if they knew Christ as their Savior, it reminds us there with Him. We know today that for brothers and sisters who passed on out of this world and into eternity that knew Christ as their Savior, we know where they are today with a living Savior. You know, it reminds us that Christ rose from the grave to be a mother and a father to those who have none, to be a friend that sticks closer than a brother, to be a help in this life, and to be a Savior for eternity. And many people today, you know, we, uh, we read of people going to Jerusalem, and they're there uh, looking to see the tomb of Jesus. There's two places I can find and articles about Jerusalem, and I've never been there, that claim to be the tomb of Jesus. Over one of them, there's built a Greek Orthodox church as a monument, and below that structure, there's an empty slab of stone that's been cut into a rock, and some people, they claim that's the tomb where Jesus was laid. There's another one. Uh, a British general, Charles Gordon, discovered a place in Jerusalem that looked like a mountain, that looked like a skull. He felt it was Golgotha, where Christ would have been crucified. And below it, in a garden, he found a tomb that was cut into the stone with a slab that was laying uh, up on the inside. And they claim, and others do, that that is the place where Jesus was laid. Now, I don't know if either of those places are the tomb that Jesus was laid in. We do know that it was Joseph's tomb, wasn't it? And we know the Lord only used it for three days. You know, we, as far as we know, Joseph was buried in Joseph's tomb when Joseph died and his family. And so it would be futile to go and try to find the tomb of Jesus or to think that an empty tomb perhaps was the one he actually arose from the grave from. But regardless of the fact, uh, we know today that the Lord Jesus Christ has risen. And we, we need to often remember and give our attention to the fact that He's a living Savior. And you know, there's a deeper inspection that we can make into that tomb. In Luke chapter 24, when we read about the resurrection of Christ in the 12th verse, we read this, Then arose Peter and ran into the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was to come. Here Peter mentions these linen clothes or the wrappings that the body of Christ would have been wrapped in, that they were left in a spot in the tomb. And then if we do a little further inspection, the Gospel of John adds this to the account of the Lord's resurrection. It says in the third verse, Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple and came into the sepulcher and they both ran together. And, and verse 5 says, And he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying. And then the uh, seventh, uh, sixth verse says, Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin, John adds, the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Here, uh, as we inspect a little deeper the resurrection of Christ in the empty tomb, it wasn't completely empty. The Bible said that in one place there were all the linen wrappings that they wrapped the body of the Lord in and they would have anointed them with spices and oils. They were laid on one side. And then on another place, in a separate place, there was a napkin, the Bible said. It would have been a clean piece of linen cloth that would have been laid over the face of the Lord Jesus like a shroud would have been laid over Him in death and that it was folded up and laying in a different place. Now, uh, the scriptures tell us that uh, uh, that these things uh, these things are worthy of a deeper attention. You know, those grave clothes uh, they were removed and laid aside uh, for those who looked in to see. And that's not that that wouldn't have been the work of a grave robber. If they, if they would have come in and just simply stolen the body of the Lord away, uh, remember there was, a, there was a group of soldiers there standing guard. How could they have gotten in? How could they have taken the body away? And why would they have taken the time to unwrap the body of Christ and leave the linen clothes lying there? And so when we look in and see the linen clothes lying there, the grave clothes, you know, it reminds us today that the grave and the clothes of the grave await every one of us. 
the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't come soon. We're all going to go by way of the grave. But that napkin was another thing. It was removed from the face and folded and lay in another area. The napkin in those days was used for two different things. Sometimes they were used at the table, like we would use a napkin to wipe our mouths as we ate. And it was customary in that day that at a meal, when the diners were finished with their meal, they would simply take their napkin and just wad it up and lie it back in the middle of the plate and get up and leave. And the servants would know that they were finished with the meal and they weren't going to be coming back. But if one of the diners were called away or the master was called away, he would fold his napkin and lay it in the seat so that if the servant came by, they would see the folded napkin lying there specifically in that place and they would know that he's coming again. They'd been called away, but that he was returning again and the servants knew uh, that he wasn't finished yet. And another use for that napkin was it was used as a handkerchief, as we might use a handkerchief to wipe away tears. I thought about the wiping of the tears at a graveside of a loved one. On the way to be crucified, Jesus, in Luke 23, verse 28, spoke to the daughters of Jerusalem, the women of the city, and He said, Weep not for Me. Weep not for Me. And, you know, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, as I read to you just a little while ago, that 13th verse speaks about sorrowing, that you sorrow not as, either's, as others which have no hope. Sorrow not as others which have no hope. Christ said, don't weep for me. You know, when you see that napkin lying there folded, that handkerchief, I think it reminds us that though death for people that know Christ as their Savior is a difficult thing to go through, that it's not a final thing. And though we may sorrow, we don't sorrow as those who have no hope of ever seeing that person ever again. Because that Christ is a living Savior, for those that know Christ as their Savior that leave this world, there's the hope that someday we'll be with them again. We'll be reunited with them. And for a child of God, death is a victory. You know, when I die, you don't have to weep for me either. Jesus said, don't weep for me. And you're not going to have to weep for me. I'm going to be in a better place. I'm going to be in the best place. I'm going to be in the place where none of us, if we could see it today, would ever want to be back. We're going to want to be in the presence of the Lord. And I, why my wife and I, we talk about this all the time. And I tell her, you know, you can bury me wherever you want to bury me. And you don't ever have to worry about coming back. Because I'm not there. I'm not going to be there. You lay this body under the ground, but I'm going to be with the presence of Christ. And you just look for the day when the Lord comes again. And uh, we're able to be together again. We think about that invitation was given. We think about how much we need to give attention to the invitation. But this last thing I just want to leave you with, he gave instruction. Instructions were given. Back in Matthew chapter 28, when those people came and they looked inside and the invitation was to see the place where the Lord lay, in verse number 7, he gave some divine instructions through that angel. He said, go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Go quickly. Here we find the angel said, come and see that the tomb is empty, but then go and tell that Jesus Christ lives again. You know, that's what's, that's what's great about Easter. Easter is a day where we remember that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. But Easter is one of those days that reminds us that we as the people of God, we have a message to tell all the 364 other days of the year that Jesus Christ is a living Savior. And that He'll save to the uttermost all that come to God by Him, seeing He ever liveth to make intercession for them. And whether it's Easter Sunday or any other day, Jesus Christ is waiting for men and women, boys and girls, to look to Him, put their faith and trust in what He's done for them and accomplished for them, and to confess that we need Him, and that our sin separates us from God. But we're willing to receive by faith the payment that He made, that God accepted, and that today we can be saved. And we just want to encourage you today. 
You maybe, maybe are here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior. Maybe you're here and you know the Lord as your Savior. We come together and we're in church on Easter Sunday. You know the great thing about Easter is it's more than just recognizing a day on the calendar or attending a church service, isn't it? Easter's more than, than those things. It's, it's receiving the real Savior into your heart and life by faith. That's what it's all about. And today there is an empty grave. And today there's an eternity that's awaiting every one of us. And we have the greatest story in the world to tell. The gospel story. The good news of Christ's death, His burial, and His resurrection. And every single day we should look to live and to share that story with men and women and boys and girls. We're going to bow our head today. I want to ask everyone if you would just to... Bow your head and close your eyes. We have a word of prayer together. And then we're going to give an invitation. And just as that angel gave an invitation to come and see the place where the Lord lay, we're going to give an invitation for you who have listened to the Word of God to respond to the truth of God's Word. The Bible tells us that all men must be saved. All men, women, boys and girls must be saved. I'm thankful that when I was 11 years old, pastor of the church that I was attending in a vacation Bible school shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. He told me how God loved me and how because of God's love for me and my sin, which separated me from God, He sent His Son. And His Son came into the world and lived a sinless and perfect life. And He pleased the Father And on the cross, the Father placed my sin upon His Son. And His Son died to pay the penalty of my sin, which was death. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus Christ paid that on my behalf. And He was buried, but He rose from the dead by the power of God. And in so doing that, God was declaring His utter satisfaction with the payment of His Son's life for our sin debt. There's no question today whether or not my sin debt's paid in Jesus Christ. If it were not paid by what He did for me, He wouldn't have risen from the dead. He wouldn't be alive today, but He is. And God accepted the penalty. The payment was paid in full. I'm thankful that day that He invited me to put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. To accept the offering, the substitute He made on my behalf. And I'm thankful that day that by faith I asked Jesus Christ to forgive my sin that sent Him to the cross. And I asked Him to come into my heart and life and save me and be my Savior. I'm thankful that day He did that. And now these many years later, I'm more convinced now than ever that He did what He promised that He would do. And that when I leave this world, I'm going to go to be where He is. I'm going to be able to live with Him forever in eternity. Not because of anything I've done, but because of what He's done. And today as we come to the end of this service, we want to give you an invitation. If you're here and you know Christ as your Savior, every day we got to look inside that tomb through the eyes of Scripture and remember He's a living Savior. And we want to live for Him. We want to share Him. We want to lift Him up. We want to tell men and women, boys and girls, every single day that He lives and that He'll save them. And that we can share Him every single day. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you say, Pastor, there's never been a time in my life when I've ever received Him, never prayed and asked Him to forgive my sins. Today I have no assurance that I'm saved. But this morning I realize, I know that I need to know more about this. I need to settle this in my own heart and life. And only you can do that, by the way. Only you can do that. Maybe you're here today and you'd like for someone to take the Bible and show you from the Scripture what Jesus Christ has done for you and how you can be saved. How you can know the joy of knowing a living Savior. If there's someone like that today, privately and certainly without embarrassing you, is there someone today who would say, I'd like to know more about that. I'd, I'd like to know what it means to be saved. Anyone just slip your hand up and write back down. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. And I'm not going to 
Don't, don't, don't talk to you in front of all these people, but maybe you'd say, I'd like to meet with you after the service. I'd like to know what it means to be saved. I'd like to have somebody sit down with the Bible and show me who Jesus Christ is for me, what he's done for me. I've never trusted him as my Savior. I don't know him today. Anyone, just slip your hand up and hold it there for a moment and back down. Now let me know. I'll be looking for you after the service. Anyone, just hold it up and right back down. Heads bowed and eyes closed. We're going to pray together. We're going to stand and we're going to sing a song. And that song's an invitation for you to come. If the Lord spoke into your heart, so out of your seat and come. Be obedient to the Lord. Know Him as your Savior on this Easter Sunday. Lord, we just ask today in Jesus' name you'd have your way. Thank you, Father, for the great message of an empty tomb. Thank you for the invitation to look into it and to behold it and to give it attention. And then, Lord, thank you, Father, for the instructions you gave us to go and to tell others. Lord, we thank you today. We've had the privilege of being able to do that. But we know your word is powerful and quick. And, God, it's like seed that's sown that will bring forth fruit and time, God, as it's watered and as it's... Uh, as it feels the warmth of the sun. Well, we just pray, Father, it will bring forth fruit that will remain in the hearts and lives of people that are here today. Thank you for this great group of people. Well, we're praying for them. We just thank you, God, for loving us. Lord, you demonstrated that love to us as you took our place on the cross. Lord, there you were willing to suffer the wrath of God for our sin debt, that we might be saved and have your righteousness. Well, we're praying this morning that, God, your way... Your will would be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together, if you would, and take a hymn book. Turn to hymn 12. Hymn number 12 in your hymn book. We're going to sing a verse of that. And we invite people to say yes to the Lord. If He's spoken to your heart, you'd like to come and meet. We'll go and find a place we can talk. You come. God's people will be obedient to Him today. But let's sing on that first verse of hymn 12. Room at the cross for you. Let's sing together. Sing the second verse, verse 2. It's been a good place to be this morning, be able to uh, be here on Easter Sunday and uh, just uh, hear about how wonderful it was that our Lord uh, and our God loved us enough that he allowed his son to die on the cross for our sin and win salvation for us through his blood. So we hope you'll come back tonight and uh, hear our uh, choir again and uh, bring somebody with you and just uh, excited about what God has done for us. But we'll finish up here today with a word of prayer. Brother Doug, you pray for us, please. Thank you that it was empty here, Lord. We thank you that you rose uh, from the dead to uh, defeat sin that uh, compels for us, Lord. We thank you that uh, that gets us free, Lord. And Lord, I pray that if there's any here that it's 
corner and it's the other day, but what I tell you every time, but today you know it's a year before it's too late. Lord, I tell you, if you bring everybody that stage here tonight, we will not fail to give you all the praise and honor.